Well, thank you all for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Kim and I'm one of the event hosts at PALS. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website, PALS.com. One of the many events we're looking forward to is climate activist and author Naomi Klein. She'll be joining us next Thursday, February 25th. If you don't already do so, please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we are so honored to welcome Robert Michael Pyle, David Cross, and Kathleen Dean Moore. Robert Michael Pyle grew up and learned his butterflies in Colorado, where he fell in love with the Magdalena Alpine and its high country habitat, the setting for his novel, Magdalena Mountain. He took his PhD in butterfly ecology at Yale University, worked as a conservation biologist in Papua New Guinea, Oregon and Cambridge, and has written full time for many years. His 25 books include Wintergreen, and these are their award winning books Wintergreen, Where Bigfoot Walks, and Sky Time in Gray's River, and Nature Matrix, New and Selected Essays, which was just named as a finalist for the Penn Diamondstein Spielvogel Award for the Art of the Essay. He lives in rural Southwest Washington State and he still studies butterflies. David Cross is an actor and writer known for Arrested Development, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and Megamind. Pyle and Cross join us tonight to discuss their roles in the recent film, The Dark Divide, a fictionalized account of Pyle's 1995 trek across the Gifford Pinchot wilderness in search of new butterfly species and a way through the grief after losing his wife. The film was based on Pyle's book, Where Bigfoot Walks, Crossing the Dark Divide. Joining Pyle and Cross in conversation this evening is Kathleen Dean Moore. Moore is the author or co-editor of many books about our moral and emotional bonds to the wild, to the wild reeling world, including Wild Comfort, Moral Ground, and Great Tide Rising. She is a recipient of the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association Award and the Oregon Book Award, along with the Willa Literary Award for her novel, Piano Tide. A philosopher and activist, Moore writes from Corvallis, Oregon and Chichigaf Island, Alaska. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. If you see a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking on the thumbs up button. And please consider supporting tonight's authors and pals by purchasing copies of their books from us. A link to purchase their books will be shared in the chat this evening. Tonight's event is special. The tonight's special event is co-sponsored by Orion Magazine, America's best environment, environmental magazine, a quarterly 100% ad free publication in print since 1982. Orion is a reader supported nonprofit at the convergence of ecology, the arts and social justice. And the magazine has maintained a long relationship with Robert Michael Pyle since its inception, publishing many of his essays over the years. We're thrilled to have had their partnership to help make tonight's event possible. Bob, David, Kathleen, it's such a pleasure to welcome the three of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Thanks, Pauls. Thanks, Orion. This is great. So I'm the one who gets to ask the questions. Uh, I don't want to waste one minute before I ask the question that I think is on the mind of every single writer listening who has a book in their bottom drawer. How did this come to be? Mild-mannered nature writer turns Hollywood. <laughs> well, I'll, may I start with that one, David? Yeah, of um, course. But before I do, I'm going to make people wait um, just a nonce longer, whatever a nonce is. And I'm going to turn it back to you, Kathy, because this would be a really good time, I think, to announce the fact that Kathy has a magnificent new book out, which is launching tomorrow night. And if we don't do it now, we might get away from us. So, Kathy, will you please tell us about the book and about the launch tomorrow night and how people can join that? I suggested to Bob that this wasn't an appropriate time to do that since this is all about your book. <laughs> I but, uh, right. Now that you've mentioned right. it, yeah. I'm really excited about 
tomorrow night. I'm excited about tonight, but I'm excited about tomorrow night too. Go to Spring Creek Project, Google Spring Creek, and you'll find the details six o'clock online. And we have guests coming, including Hank Lenfer, Libby Roderick, Hob Osterland, and um, Rochelle McCabe, and a special surprise appearance by my shy husband who promises to give us three sentences. Thank you, Bob. But And, and the book is The Earth's Wild Music, right? I almost forgot to say that. <laughs> the Earth's Wild Music, yeah. is that correct? Good, that thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Kathy. Okay, and, so now how did this come to be? And also thank you, Paulus and, and dear Ryan. Well, this came to be because somebody read the book. This is the current iteration of the book that you'll find if you buy it at Powell's or, or your favorite indie. And um, an earlier edition was read by a man who joined us moments ago by the name of Tom Putnam. I didn't know Tom yet, but I came to know him very well soon. Tom's a filmmaker residing in Los Angeles. And Tom wrote me or called me and said, uh, I liked your book. I grew up nearby. The country touches me. I like the story. Um, I'm a filmmaker. I'm interested in making a movie. And uh, <laughs> that's cool. People had, you know, used the book in various documentaries, interviewed me, took pieces of it. A Japanese film crew came and did a, a weekly um, episode of their sort of Tokyo Animal Planet, Hollywood Squares crazy program about it and so on. But to make an actual movie from it, I'd never had that. And of course, writers always dream about such a thing. So I said, well, sure, send me, you know, let me see your movies. So Tom sent me a number of his documentaries, which I rapidly fell in love with. Uh, the one I'll mention is about the Detroit Fire Department called Burn. Absolutely stunning film that received awards all over and displayed in fire halls, and movie houses all over the country. I got all kinds of awards. So I loved it. I love Tom's work and he seemed like a very cool guy. And so I um, uh, went, th went through my agent, but uh, their film department wasn't particularly head over heels because it was gonna be indie and it was gonna be a documentary and, and so on and so forth. So Tom and I went at it together on our own and we came up with the contract and we, uh, and I, I said, cool, if that ever happens, that'll be nice. But then it, it, it didn't, um, it didn't uh, languish. It just kind of sat on Tom's desk for several years while he began to try to build some support and he renewed the option every year. And then finally, a couple of years ago, Tom began to get some major support, including from uh, the producer of uh, the great film, uh, Napoleon Dynamite, Jory White's. And then things started rolling and um, Tom made some major changes, which we'll get into later. The main one being going from a documentary into a feature film, a narrative. And then he began to get cast. And that's where it got really interesting. And he got yeah. this, this stunning cast, the star of which is with us tonight. Actually, there are, two, there are two of us here tonight, David. Look, uh, David's here twice tonight. I think I should just leave it here like this, OK? Yeah, I'm two Davids on this perfect. And so that's, that's how it happened. Uh, uh, Kathy, just a guy read my book, liked the book, made movies, said, let's, let's put on a show. I guess that's how lightning strikes. That's just great. And David, at some point, they came to you. And um, when, you first read, when you first read through the script, did it speak to you? What was it that made you say at some point, I want to, um, I want to make this movie? Was it, for example, at the point when you learned that an owl was going to claw your head? <laughs> Uh, well, that I had written into the contract. That wasn't in there originally. Um, no, they offered me $125, and I thought about it, and I was like, yeah. This is before they showed me the script, and I was like, oh, I'm in. And they, they said, do you want to see what the script is? And I was like, $125, bucks. i will do whatever you want. And then they, but I was like, sure, send me the script. So uh, the a lot of things kind of happened at once uh, uh, for me when I read the script. One was um, I really liked the story and uh, I thought it was a challenge that I was um, up for. And it's a, it's an opportunity. I don't often get this kind of uh, role and um, you know, there's not a, a ton of dialogue in it. It's a lot of, you know, introspective emotional moments and um 
and uh, and I was interested in the evolution of the character, uh, you know, that starts out. And we we took some took some liberties with uh, uh, Robert's real story, as as anybody does when they're you know adapting a real life story into a film. It's a different medium, and um, and uh, Tom and I, you know, I met with Tom. Because uh, so, so those things were all in place, and those things have to be in place before you move forward. And then the next big step was to meet with Tom uh, Putnam, the writer director, and see how we connected. Because uh, I've done this enough to know that if you're, especially with something like this, where you're out in the woods with a skeleton crew, you know, uh, and it, with no amenities and um, and a lot of difficult situations, if you're not connecting and on the same page with the director, uh, that can be a really bad experience and um, for everyone. And so that was the next step to to meet with Tom and see if he dug me and I dug him and. We met up at a bar in LA. I happened to be in Los Angeles working, so that was convenient. And I met, we were going to meet for, I think, maybe an hour. And we ended up there for like three hours. Uh, both of us got hammered. And um, uh, I responsibly took a lift home. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but, uh, um, and we, you know, we definitely connected. He was an interesting, fascinating guy, cool guy, down to earth no Hollywood bullshit, uh, um, just a genuine guy with a real passion for this, uh, completely open to collaboration. And that sealed it, you know? And then we, we moved forward. I started researching Robert Pyle and reading and, and re, you know, working on the script with, uh, with Tom and going back and forth. And we did that for uh, close to a year before I actually started shooting. But yeah, that's how I came to be in it. That's cool. So somebody needs to give us the elevator pitch. I mean, what's the storyline here? Just a couple sentences of, of how the story unfolds. Bob, why don't you do that? And then I have a question for you. Okay. First, I want to say that uh, I want to echo David to say that I wanted to meet Tom too, get together and see what kind of a dude he was. So he, you know, we didn't do it in LA though. He came up here and we actually went to the Dark Divide. We went out to uh, Ariel, Washington to Chief Leluska's Longhouse which for many years was the great place to watch the uh, the Hamitz dances, the Bukwis and Tonakwa and Bakbakwali Nuxiwe Kwakutl dances performed, which are the Bigfoot based dances. We didn't get to see the dances performed, but we met uh, Chief Leduska's daughter, uh, Fawn, and um, Fawn Lily. And, and we were out in the woods all day with Tom and, and his son, Jack, his cool son, Jack, and myself. and we like David and Tom, we hit it off. We got hammered too, but pretty much hammered on on nature, I think. And um, that was in the contract too? <laughs> the beers came later. Oh yeah, beer is in the contract. No, but we uh, we hit it off too. Well, Kathy, the, the through line is a little different as people will have noticed to have seen both between the book and the movie, but they share a common basic story, which is that a guy goes into the woods intentionally like some others we've known um, not to practice any exercise in bravado or big exploration or high adventure but to come to terms with some very important things in his life and stuff happens to him out there partly his own making and partly not and some of the things he was looking for he finds some he wasn't looking for at all he finds or find him including certain people and in the end he comes out a somewhat different and chastened and wizened or wizened i hope and uh, not wizened at all because he's actually fitter when he comes out in some ways although bloody and mangled and uh, <laughs> and changed and grown so that's the central story it's uh, that's great it's your basic uh, hero's journey not to say hero in that sense, but in the Boy, this is this is a long elevator ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, this is okay. the, we're going up well, to then, the tower. 
<laughs> but but David, the, the, the plot requires you to do some pretty interesting backwoods stuff. Are you a backwoods guy? And um, you had some tough times out there. And I'm wondering, I mean, um, how uh, the half drowning in a river didn't look like very much fun. And uh, having, you have stunt people, I presume? I'm sorry, oh, what? You have stunt people. How much of this did you do yourself? Um, I, I definitely, uh, there were uh, a really great dedicated uh, stunt. Um, there was like kind of like a, a safety guy who was part of the stunt crew. And then a guy, it was really these two guys. And then this other guy who uh, shaved his head, grew, you know, grew his facial hair out. We put stuff on him. And the, um, uh, I did most of the stunts, but there's one that this guy did that I just, I mean, it's, I don't know how he did it, but I, I'm, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a segment uh, in the lava tubes where, you know, I slip and fall down several rocks. I mean, big rocks, yeah. a long way. Yeah. And I didn't do that. He did that. And, and I mean, when you watch that, you're just, I, I mean, we were there. I, that's, you know, there's only so much padding you can really do. And, and also I'm in my underwear. So he had to match that. There's no, there's nothing under clothing because there's no clothing. And uh, um, that's one that I was like happy, happy to let him do. But, you know, uh, most of the time I do, I, uh, in, in all the stuff I do, I try to do my own stunts um, and I enjoy them. They're fun. Well, how much fun was it to go in your underpants down a Northwest Rivers half under and half over the water? Uh, that was not fun at all. Um, no. And it's interesting that you point that out because it's, it on film, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, you can't really tell how cold that water is. I mean, we shot in the real place and all that water was, um, that was ice maybe okay. 25, 30 minutes ago. That was ice and it's all, um, you know, snowpack that's coming down and, uh, and there was no reason to shoot it there um, because you can't tell. But it was, uh, that was probably one of the most dangerous things we did because of the hypothermia and the safety guys yeah. were there like, pull them out now, you know, and uh, it, was an, it, was, it was one of the craziest uh, um, experiences I've had. And when I say crazy, I don't mean fun, like a roller coaster, it was uh, scary. Cause I stopped, yeah. I started losing, um, thoughts. I, I couldn't, uh, it was very weird. I, 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 the analogy I use is that, um, it was like putting one of those lead aprons you get uh, at the dentist or when they give you an x-ray, it was like just sort of putting it on your brain. So that was just sort of, but then I kind of came out of it and all that, but it was a uh, very, uh, that was, but, but you can't tell, I don't think you can tell on camera. I've watched the film, you know, uh, a dozen times now. And, um, uh, I wish there was some way to know that that water was 32 degrees. <laughs> well, the people in the Pacific Northwest know exactly how cold that yeah, water there, there is. You so go. you're all right with that audience. But you did two takes of that, right? <gasps> yeah, I, I, I kind of uh, uh, did as much as I could in that first take. And it was really, I didn't know how bad it was going to be. And, um, and Tom was just like, we, we, I got to get you just doing this, please, man. Come on, get back in there. Da, da, da. And that's when the safety guy. I can't remember his name. He was awesome. He was on the side and, you know, I did what I could. And then he started yelling, pull him out, pull him out now. And they grabbed me. Um, but it was, and it was one of the few times I've ever been like, I don't, you know, almost crying. Like I can't, I don't want to do it. Oh, I can't. Yeah. You know, um, how about the cliff? How about the cliff, David? The cliff wasn't hard. Uh, the cliff was, um, it was fun. That was fun to me. And look, I'm, uh, you can't see it, but there's a, there's a, uh, a little line. So I'm never going to fall all the way over. There's somebody, you know, a good, uh, you know, 50 yards away, way, way far away. And there's this little line and, um, uh, and I was able to hold on to it. And, you know, the, the other thing is they shot it so that it looks like I'm hanging off a cliff like this, but I'm really hanging off a cliff like that. So it's not, you know, it's dangerous, but it's nothing that 
I didn't. I I I happily went and did that. I you know that stuff's kind of fun. Um, you know, David, that came across. I don't know if I've told you this before, but almost all of the um, trials and tribulations you go through in that film are based on actual episodes in the book, and that one is very very close. And the several yeah. of the scenes are uncannily close to how it actually occurred. Well, you know, we were that wasn't our original. We were originally supposed to shoot gosh, about a um, hundred yards down from that spot. And there was like this tree, like this kind of, you know, dead, you know, knotted mangled kind of tree that was sort of poking out. And the safety guy, the safety guy was like, no way, you're not doing this. And, um, and I was just trying to talk him into it. And we were all trying to talk him into it. And, and Sean, the DP was like, I think we can get this. And he was like, this is not going to work. And then we spent I don't know, 20 minutes, like looking around, like, and then we found a place like, what about this? And, uh, and then it took me a while to convince the guy to let me do it. Um, which happens a lot on things. They just don't want you to do it. And, uh, and you just got to talk yourself, talk them into it. But, um, uh, you know, that was, that was something we had to kind of find on the spot because they wouldn't let us do the original one, which was truly kind of, that one was scarier. Yeah. Uh, there well, was, uh, Oh, there's a question. May I, may I hit that question, Kathy? Of course. The person just asked, said there was no safety guy on the scene for Robert. <laughs> uh, how did how did I deal with that situation? I wasn't in the river as long. I, I was uh, got, I scrambled out pretty quickly. It was just as cold. It was just as dangerous. Um, and it was at least as stupid, probably more so. But uh, I wasn't in there as long. I was able to get out. It could have been curtains. It absolutely could have been curtains, as several other things could have been. What it did was give me an absolutely wonderful springboard for a little sub essay about uh, which is the superior ape and how that would not have been a big problem for a Bigfoot. Yeah. Well, then tell us, tell us, Bob, um, what, what is it like to see your life spread out on the big screen? And I, what does it feel like to see yourself portrayed? Um, and, and if you don't mind my asking, what is it like to see your grief so fully portrayed? Well, boy, those are all three big questions. I won't try to deal with all of them in, in depth right now. But first of all, let me say that uh, the experience of having your art translated into a different, perhaps higher form of art by magnificent professional people, filmmaker, crew, cast, and what a crack crew it was, wasn't it, David? Mm -hmm. uh, Yes. And, the, and the cast I can't say enough about is simply- Very attractive cast, very attractive. Very attractive cast, incredibly sexy cast. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> and it's uh, But it's overwhelming in a way. It's, it's weird, it's odd. Um, it's uh, deeply gratifying if you like the movie. And it's very, very, I have to say, it's very humbling, very humbling, but just a lot of fun more than anything else. That's the first part. Uh, the second part is see your life transformed. Well, it's not really my life. It's a story inspired by my life. And a lot of elements of my life come into it. And a lot of them are, are changed through the artistic lens, which we can talk a little more about too, as one would expect. Um, but it's, uh, it's very flattering for the most part. There are certain parts that are not at all flattering. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. And I don't, and you don't want the experience to be flattering. You want it to be, have some kind of verisimilitude. And in, in large part, this movie does. There are some other parts that, that uh, some people will say, that's not Bob, but it's not supposed to be Bob. It's David, who's an artist, working with Tom, who's an artist, interpreting the world through a story that I happen to be lucky enough to provide. So that's cool. We'll talk more about that. But then uh, as far as the grief, um, that was a tough thing for me to... Um, to watch those scenes that were played masterfully by Deborah Messing, a wonderful actress, a wonderful actor and a wonderful person um, who studied Tia and asked me for photographs of her and talked to my, my stepdaughter Dory about her mother and, and researched the person in order to really inhabit her. Just as David read my books and talked with me, David and I went out and chased butterflies together and worked on how to use a butterfly net. These actors, put themselves into the place. They did not do this as a toss off. And so when it came to the very, very difficult scenes to watch, which still make me ball, um, I was, 
moved beyond words and moved to tears. And again, deeply, deeply gratified that that people of such caliber would pay attention to Tia and me like that. That's, th those scenes were very, very beautiful. There's a scene on the front porch and it's not my house. People who have been here think it's my front porch. It looks like it, but it was an old house in Vernonia, Oregon that stood in, in many ways. Thank goodness they didn't try to film in my squalor here. But uh, that scene, David, of you and Deborah on the front porch with you at the old electric typewriter Deborah with her with her caftan and her top and so on and you're tickling and it's a sweet and wonderful scene and it could have been us it just plain frogging could have yeah. been us that one gets me every time uh-huh yeah you know um I hope I, I don't give too much away but um you spend a lot of time Bob running around in your underwear <laughs> I want to know when this film this this film was made. Was that mosquito season? I'm going to let David say most about that, but I will say two things. One of them is that uh, when you're watching and do watch the credits, everybody watch the credits. Yes, because, yes, I want to talk about that too. Yeah. Them, okay, good. Uh, but one of the uh, one of the personages or entities thanked in the credits is uh, Fruit of the Loom. So yeah. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> but the other thing is. Uh, Last night, I watched a wonderful reading and conversation with the poet Jane Hirschfield. Yes. Live. And um, I want to tell her it's her fault, all the underwear, because it's a scene in the toward the end of the book, having read a poem of Jane's when I was up in the Dark Divide for the last time that autumn, when I decided to, to just take my clothes off and walk down the moonlit white pumice path as I was in the presence of whatever was there unmediated by clothing. And I think it's Tom's inspiration from that scene that led to all the underwear scenes. Take it, <laughs> take it, David. Well, there's, a, there's, we found practical reasons to be in the, under, in the underwear. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, one was when he falls in the bear shit and he's got to wash his clothes. Um, and he's kind of, you know, drying, they're drying out and he's laying on the, <laughs> by the, the lake there. And, um, and then he's soaking wet when he descends into the, the lava tubes. And, and then of course I don't have the underwear on when I'm bathing in the waterfall. Uh, um, it, I feel like that seems like there's more underwear <laughs> scenes that there are just cause they tend to stand out because it's this old dude in tidy whities you know. <laughs> and, I mean, he's got a good body. He wears them well. <laughs> <laughs> well oh, then, I, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> I love the one where you're chasing the, the butterfly with the uh, with your maid net mm -hmm. in your tidy whities and, and then you're chasing the sound out there. Yeah. And then you come next to the track. And by the way, your foot next to that track, take a look in the book. There's a photograph of my foot next to the first set of tracks I found. It's the yeah. same picture. It's the same. I was going to, I was going to say that that's a, you know, to those of you who haven't seen or watching this and haven't seen it, that's, a, that's uh spot on what happened, you know, as is the final scene in the movie. Absolutely spot on. But, but I love at the end of that one scene and, and you look down at it and you're kind of humbled by what you're seeing and you take that net, that skinny net, and you put it in front of you and you just kind of like it's protecting you. Oh, that yeah, was all, that's all he's got. And all of a sudden he's very, very aware that he's in his underwear, you know, sitting and in the middle of nowhere. Out there. That was brilliant. With, with a stick. <laughs> well then, but then let me ask, it was that improvised. How much of the how much of the film did you improvise? I know that you are a, a stand-up comic. In fact, uh, your website says you are one of the 400 best stand-up comics in the United States. It's, it's now 500, but yeah, I'm one of the top 500 stand-ups in the in in the eastern northeastern part of the United States. Well, that is deeply impressive. And so, let me ask you: Did that? Did you put those skills to work in the film? Um. Yeah. I mean, there's not a. I'm trying to think how much. It's not a ton that was improvised. I mean, um, reactions, I guess, to moments. Were, were kind of left for me to um, react to. Um, and uh, a lot of the, the scene, um, 
a lot of the scene in the uh, gas station uh, in the beginning is, um, and that we cut that way down. That was that was uh, that was one of those things where we had sh that scene we shot. Um, gosh, that was like one of the last couple of days, and I was so starved to talk to somebody and kind of act with a human being after after so much time in the woods and and reacting to nature and stuff i and and i know cameron uh esposito uh from the stand-up uh world and um so i was just so delighted just to hang out and get to do a scene with her so there's a lot of improvising in that but really i mean i, I mean just sort of you know, it's a lot of reactions and, 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 uh, um, I mean, nothing was really improvised in the scene with Gary Farmer with the logging camp. That was all pretty scripted. Um, and again, there's not a ton of dialogue, so it's like improvising, yeah. reacting to situations. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say it's a very, very funny film. As much as it'll make you cry, it'll also make you laugh. And when you get all the way down to the credits, it's stunning how many people were involved in that. And two things stood out to me. There was a listing for a butterfly wrangler. Yep. And, and, there, was a, and there was a listing for an owl wrangler, which I <laughs> confess that I have never seen before. So Bob, why don't you tell us about the butterfly wrangler? Was it you? No. And then, and then David, maybe tell us about the, how they got that owl to actually land on your head. Yeah, two different questions here. Just before that, I want to say one thing about this stand-up. Uh, I wish everybody could see everything that was done out there. I got two days on, on sets, two very different days on sets. Vernonia, uh, kind of a somber but wonderful day. And, and then uh, a brilliant day with the Native American cast. Kimberly Guerrero, who recently won a major Native American uh, Film Festival Award for this movie, um, and, and, and the rest of the, the crew. The Harvest Moon, brilliant, brilliant uh, Quinault storyteller whose story you can see around the campfire in the, uh, uh, in the added material on the DVD. So if you see the streaming, pick up the DVD too, because there's a lot of good stuff on that that didn't make it in the movie. And one of them was another fine actor in this movie, who's David Koechner, who's another top comedian. I mean, David jokes about the top 500. David's one of the most highly regarded comics in the country. There's no two ways around it. And, and, uh, and so is David Kector. And the two of them together, off camera, whether well, they were on camera, but it didn't make it in, around the campfire, because we shot at that campfire all night long. Many, many takes. There's one word David couldn't get right, and we would, lots of takes. But when he and David Cross started going together around that campfire, they had the entire film crew at 3.30 in the morning in utter stitches. I wish everybody could see that. Yeah, and I Dave, so too. Very special. I've, I've worked with him a number of times and uh, it's always such a treat because he's also a really good guy and he brings a great energy and he's he's one of those guys who learns everyone's names and he's like uh, kind and effusive and um, and makes sure that everybody is, you know, feeling good. And, and it's also really important when you're, when it's, you know, three in the morning and everybody's tired and we shot until the sun came up. We, yeah, we, we didn't do it anymore because... It was supposed to be night, and as the sun was starting to come up, we had to call it. But um, uh, I mean, he's he's just a treat to to work with, you know. He's, he's for, sorry for a guy who's so good at playing jerks, and he's a jerk <laughs> in this movie. He's very good at playing jerks, but he's a darn nice guy. That's great. That's so the great. butterfly, the butterfly wrangler, was not me. I didn't have time in the summer, and I, yeah, you know, I. It's, it, it's a lot of work out there in the high mountains and I'm not sure I'm up to it anymore. But I suggested uh, one of our great Oregon lepidopterists, you might've met him, he's on campus a lot. His name is Dana, uh, Dana Ross. And Dana is the, um, one of the curators at the Oregon Arthropod Collection there on campus. Mm -hmm. And Dana uh, is the premier freelance butterfly conservation monitor scientist field guy that goes out and does all the contracts on rare butterflies. So uh, Tom hired him as butterfly wrangler. He got the butterflies, he got the right species, he brought them in and, uh, and he worked with them. Some of it green screen, some of it manipulated, but much of it natural. 
And when you see the scene in the, uh, in the lava field after David comes out of the cave, after David Bob comes out of the cave, and the one golden butterfly comes and lands on the backpack, yeah. and he just observes it, he doesn't catch, he just observes it. That's exactly the right butterfly. It's the rarest butterfly in Washington. And it's in exactly the right place. And he just banged it. David will have to tell you about the owl. Yeah, tell us about the owl. How did they make it land? This is an amazing scene, everybody. Um, that was, a, a, I'm not exaggerating this for comic effect. This is all real. First of all, that owl is huge and, um, and, and shockingly uh, hefty. It's very dense. Um, and uh, the hat I'm wearing, that kind of leather-ish, you know, canvas hat, we had a, um, a thick bit of padding about that big underneath sewn into the top. And when that owl landed and its talons are so sharp, it still got through that. I mean, I'm talking like that thick plus the whatever the canvas top of the part, but it just like landed. And um, the way they got it to fly over was uh, these guys, I think they came from Georgia, I believe. Um, and they've done a lot of movies and they have all kinds of animals and stuff. And they're off screen about, uh, you know, maybe uh, 15, 20 feet from the frame. And they've got frozen mice, dead <laughs> frozen mice. And they're throwing it at me to get the owl to come and land on my head. Uh, but they, they're so far away and this isn't, you know, the guy's not a, you know, ex pitcher or anything. So they're, they're like, they're trying to get land it here or up here. And it's just, they're whacking me in the face. And that, that happened a couple of times. And, you know, you just have to stand there because you don't know, you know, that one of the shots, one of the shots is I'm in the frame and they could just kind of, you know, cut around the mouse hitting me. So you just stand there as if, you know, dead frozen mice aren't whacking you in the face repeatedly and just waiting for the owl to come. And that's what it is. They, they, they just dead frozen mice until the owl went down like this. And then, you know, that was a lot of, uh, but um, the owl was, uh, was fantastic to work with um, a bit a bit demanding, but yeah, it was, uh, uh, I hope I get to work with he or she again, or they, I don't know, I don't know. And you ended up with talon wounds in your head? Yeah, you I mean like not, I wouldn't, they weren't like bloody rips or anything, but they definitely left a mark. Uh, okay. And it definitely went through there. And and that owl is, is heavier than it looks. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I didn't Everybody. know that. I didn't know. I don't know nothing about no owls. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to know if it was really a spotted owl, which is the owl that came very, very close to my head. It might well have landed on my head. And I know other spotted owl researchers that have been struck and landed on by spotted owls. But uh, in the book, spotted owl plays an important role and it does come damn close to doing so. But um, you can't film spotted owls. Uh, that was not a spotted owl. No, but... it's, a, no, it's against the law. It's an endangered species. What it was, was a European eagle owl uh, that was made up by the makeup department to look more like a spotted owl. But it was, um, wait, huh. did makeup actually, that, that must have been done in post. No yeah, way. it was done post. I'm making a joke. Oh, okay. I'm not oh. very good at stand-up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the top 500 million. It was a... Uh, a beautiful bird, though, is yeah. really majestic and impressive. It's it's quite something to see right up close. It's one of the heaviest owls in the world, though. So yeah, I can I can attest to that. Yes, <laughs> oh. it, was, it was literally like having, you know, like a seven or eight year old tubby kid jump on your head. You know, <laughs> be like, oh, okay, all right. There are so many questions I want to ask you, and I think we have room for only one before we get to the audience question and answer. So let me ask you this, Bob. We're, um, you're a scientist, and in your books, you always get the science right. So when you did told your friends, your writer friends, that you were writing a book called Where Sasquatch Walks, we were scratching our heads. So my question to you is, have you ever seen Sasquatch, and was he nice? Well, I'm going to have to boil a few things into a short answer here. <laughs> um, the book is called Where Bigfoot Walks Crossing the Dark Divide. 
I did get a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, but it was for Bigfoot studies, not for butterfly studies. And that's the weirdest thing of all. If Bigfoot walked into, into David's Toronto apartment right now and sat in his lap and started feeding him bonbons and reciting 17th century Dutch poetry, that would not be as weird as me getting a Guggenheim to work on Bigfoot. But the idea was to investigate the complete um, ethos and being of Bigfoot, which does walk in the Northwest, whether it walks in flesh and blood or not, not to prove it, not to disprove it. Yes, I was looking at Bigfoot as a biologist, which is one of the unique things about the book, and as a literary writer, which is the other one. Uh, and uh, consequently, I made a, an interesting hybrid book that I think is a, a, darn, a darn good book, but it, uh, but it wasn't trying to find Bigfoot or prove it. The surprising thing was that after looking into Bigfoot for a year's research that the grant provided, and then going into the dark divide, a land rich in Bigfoot lore, to see not could I find it, but what is my sense of it, I came out with an open mind as to its actual existence. And in the new edition, you'll find a chapter at the end uh, with seven reasons that keep my, my hope, well, not hope and not belief, but my sense that it could exist alive. Uh, I'm a scientist, I have not seen it, I can't tell you it exists. But the evidence is such that first of all, Jane Goodall calls it, says that the evidence is overwhelming, irresistible. And secondly, it's too much to dismiss out of hand. I found tracks three times under situations that are not easily to explain otherwise. And there's lots and lots of other, if you're interested in that, read the book, but it actually becomes a secondary thing in the movie. It was Tom's decision to make three major fictional shifts in the movie. And one of them was to shift the balance of the book away from Bigfoot and toward the butterflies, yeah. which was very smart because you know how the movie would be treated. It would be dismissed as yet another silly Bigfoot movie as they all are. Yeah. This way Bigfoot's in the movie then it's profound and it's important to the character and to the story, but it's much subtler and I think very smart. Beautifully handled, uh, yeah. And by the way, that final scene is just how it happened. And then the second thing that was shifted fictionally was the timeline, particularly for Tia's illness and death. They did not occur in the same timeline that is shown in the movie, but they were otherwise very, very, very much like that. And, uh, and it did affect me that way and it did affect my, my heart in the way that, that the trip did. So I could, I could deal with that. The third thing that was a little tougher for me is that uh, David will be the first to tell you he's not Mr. Wilderness. I mean, he's, he's smart and he, he did extremely well out there and he studied to do even better. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, he goes, the deal is he goes out there and he's kind of a doofus in the woods, right? And he makes some very poor decisions <laughs> and, and he doesn't know stuff. He doesn't know an Oregon grape from a blueberry at first. And those are all great scenes, um, but it wasn't me. Uh, you know, I've <laughs> studied Northwest natural history for a long time. I've known Oregon grape for 50 years and I'm a relatively adept uh, woodsman and, and camper. But here, here's why that's fine because Kathy, you don't have a story, especially the, you know, the quest archetyped where the character doesn't have room to grow and change and develop. Yeah. That's got to happen. You got to start down magic flute, Beowulf, I don't care what it is, a walk in the woods for that matter. You got to start down and hopefully you come out higher up. And David did that masterfully. You he wouldn't did. have a story if I went, if he went into the woods already yeah. as an REI veteran. Second thing is you don't hire somebody like David Cross and don't give him some room for his comic jobs. That would be just stupid. And the third thing is with the heavy parts of that movie with Deborah and Tia, I think everyone would agree that the movie needs and gets some needed comic relief from those scenes. So I'm cool with it. You know, uh, I don't care if people know me, they know better and if they don't, they don't care. And <laughs> frankly, I did a lot of the stupid things that did get me in trouble, even though I'm fairly adept in the woods. So most of the scenes that David does, you know, were my own doing. And so the shoe kind of fits, so it's just fine. I'm just so honored to be played by him. Um, I, I, you know, he could he could make me a lot dumber than that. I'd still like it. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Well, you know, it's a wonderful movie. And I have to say that the very last scene, the last line, if I remember David, is yours. And it says, I don't know what happens next, but I'll be there which is absolutely perfect. And I'm so glad to know that. I don't know what you're gonna do next, David, 
and Bob, but I do know you will be there for it and so will your fans. So thank you for those answers. And let's, um, uh, Kim, can you help me here figuring out about the questions? Hey, can, I, can I jump in real quick before we do that? This, there's a question that came up on this chat thing. I know that this is cheating because it's a different thing, but I want to know the answer to this. And it would be for Bob uh, from uh, Leah Smestad. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. We just fin finished the film prior to this and we were curious as to what sound was that, that what was, what was the sound that continued to follow Dr. Pyle's character? Was it inspired by a sound from the real world? Yes. So, yeah. Yes, it's inspired by the sound that I heard in several instances, including just prior to that, that final scene in the movie, uh, which by the way, is accompanied by the best musical accompaniment of a scene in all filmdom, I think. The soundtrack for the movie with the Avett brothers and others is stunning, but the Giants in the Trees song, Ode to Pacific Anarchism for that final scene is absolutely perfect. He hears the whistles, and then something happens that I won't spoil for people. But the whistles are that but the whistles the, are represented as Bigfoot, and those are the whistles. That that's the sound that you heard when you were out there. Correct. Uh, yeah. They were more varied than that. Sometimes mm -hmm. sharper, sometimes lighter, sometimes more metallic. But that was the basic whistle. Yes, and not only that. Let me tell you this: uh, the first big read. Oh, yeah. Um, it wasn't Powell's, but it was your your. Um, yeah, Tom says it's a combination of various large primate whistles that they used for the movie. That's right. And, and it's represented to be this large primate. Now, the publication day for that book in 1995, I was reading at Elliott Bay Books in Seattle. It was a big day. I had my first review ever in the New York Times Book Review, and it wasn't bad. It was okay, and so on and so forth. But at the end of this knockout reading with hundreds of people there, at the end, back of the room were 12 Quileut Indians from La Push, long before vampires and werewolves moved into La Push in Twilight. And they had the real monsters then, and that was the Bigfoot. And they said, we came to your reading to see that you treated the subject with respect. And I was shivering in my boots, you know. I knew that Sherman Alexi, if we, I think we can say his name, liked it, so I felt good about that. But then they said, we do, we feel you treated it with respect. And now we would like to play tapes of what this animal sounds like oh. outside our, our village. Not so you'll come find it, but so you will respect that it's part of our community. And we think you're foolish to even ask the question if it exists. And they played the tapes and there were those whistles, very oh. much like that. So yeah. yes, thank you for the question. They are represented as who knows in the movie, but maybe I mean, they were there where the tracks were. And in fact, in my real life, they were as well. And I suspect that if the animal does walk, um, that it, that's part of its vocabulary because I know the sounds of the other Washington birds and mammals very well. And the whistles that I was hearing repeatedly are not present in their vocabularies to my knowledge. Okay, let's, let's answer as many of these as we can. And here's a good one. We know that, um, uh, Kenny asks, we know that butterflies are declining at a, at a shameful, desperately quick rate. Do you think films like this can increase interest in conservation? Very quick reply. I sure hope so. That's yeah. my greatest hope for this movie and this book is, uh, is that it increases that kind of awareness. Yes, butterflies are going down from neonicotinoids and development and climate and everything else. Uh, and lots of other habitats too. And in fact, it's a misnomer really to talk about the dark divide wilderness in this case, because what I want is for the dark divide to become a federal protected wilderness someday, which it has not yet. And very much hope that uh, that it will partly, maybe this movie will help, David? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of hope. I'm very hopeful that this will, um, have a positive effect and certainly not a negative effect or even a, a negligent effect on, um, on conservation, especially for that, that part of the country, um, which I had never been to before. And it's um, just stunning and beautiful and uh, very impactful. And uh, unlike any, and I've done camping and stuff, mostly East Coast, but unlike anything I've ever experienced, the, the woods out there are, are, it's a different, it's a different thing. It's very specific and unique. So 
I, I hope so. That's another question. People want to know if the dark divide is protected or will be protected. Well, it's a, it's a big part of the book. It's one of the main reasons I wrote the book. And uh, I really think the uh, reason I got the, the Guggenheim and the book contract, probably the movie too, was because of that cool name, the dark divide. What a wonderful, oh, wonderful name that is. Um, and yet what people don't really need to know, but they'll find out in the book, is that it's really just named for some dude named Dark. He was a, a pioneer oh. out there. <laughs> and the divide is a watershed divide. But think about it, the dark divide, the divide oh, yeah. between uh, belief and non-belief, between spirituality and physical, you know, any divide you want is right there in that name. And, uh, but the dark divide roadless area, the, big, the biggest unprotected wilderness in Washington was originally named by the Forest Service Amoeba because of all the cuts in it that made it all amoeba shaped. But nobody was gonna create a wilderness area called amoeba. So Susan Saul and the other conservationists got behind it and they created a movement and they changed the name to the Dark Divide, which is the local name. So that's, that's good. But then we've had a succession of legislators. Uh, our current third district representative is a person I'm deeply honoring for her recent vote in Congress very much, uh, Jamie Herrera Butler. But, uh, but she has not been a uh, proponent of, of wilderness. The great thing is that Senator Maria Cantwell has just introduced a bill to Congress to codify the roadless rule in the national forests, which we're just darn lucky that, what's his name, never got rid of. He easily could have. That has protected the dark divide for the, ever since Clinton. The Clinton forest plan and the roadless rule protected it. But if they codify that, it will be protected. But we but, won't get the motorcycles out until we get a wilderness area. Yeah. David, there, there's a lot of people who are real sticklers for fact here. And they want to know, um, did you film in, in 8K or over in the Gifford Pinchot Forest? Um, did you really carry all that food in that backpack? It seemed kind of small. Did you actually, did you actually camp out and did the film crew camp with you? Um, well, that, that's a lot going on there. Uh, uh, We're trying to get it covered here. <laughs> there, uh, I did not, um, we did not have the pack stuff to capacity uh, with heavy stuff. We had, you know, uh, uh, lighter stuff that was in there to fill it out. And then some other, you know, things on top that I could pull out. We did not have it packed to like it's, you know, 50 or 75 pound capacity. No. Um, uh, and we did shoot in the real places. And I don't know if the, is, is that called Ape Cave, Robert, where we shot? The cave you shot in is a, a private cave. Ape Cave can't be filmed in. But what you filmed in is an actually more impressive cave called Cheese Cave, the Cheese Caves. Cheese, that's right. It's where they put the cheese. Yeah. Um, that was a legit, uh, um, extremely dangerous, uh, very impressive, scary, weird day of shooting down there with like not so much oxygen no uh, obviously no ventilation we were way down you descend quite quite far it's freezing cold um and and the floor is you know jagged hummus and uh uh it was pretty crazy down there that was and that was a full day that was 12 hours in there um no sunlight and it was it was a very strange uh unhealthy place to be um <laughs> and uh what were uh what were the other questions did you did you camp out did you carry all your food <laughs> uh i did not carry all my food um but, but bob, the question really was the question really was did bob carry all his food and how oh, did yeah that... yeah well uh, actually uh in in my trek um i did not have a support crew i I didn't have it. anybody else except I, um, uh, as you know, the timeline was changed. Tia was in fact still living when I took my track. And we had an arrangement whereby I was going to do it in, in uh, one long backpack all the way. Um, mm -hmm. And Tia was going to re-provision me at three points. When I crossed the Lewis River, when I crossed uh, the Pacific Crest Trail at one point and so on. But in fact, I had to alter that plan early on because of dehydration. Uh, water in the high dark divide was extremely difficult to obtain as I discovered. And uh, I got kind of seriously dehydrated. 
and I had to be helped out by some lummy Indian women who were collecting berries. And that drew into that whole Native American episode in the movie. And yes, a gun was pulled on me because they thought I was Bigfoot. All that really happened. But then they saved my butt by giving me some water and getting me out of there. And then I started over and did plan B, which was a series of backpacks, day hikes, driving my half million mile, 30 year old tiny Honda on logging roads to get into places I couldn't have backpacked into. And in fact, I did a much more interesting trip that was much more of a mosaic, but I did hike the bulk of it. And, um, and I carried a 75 pound pack much of the time, about a third of that being water. Okay, <laughs> so the last two questions then, David, are for you. Did you camp? And um, okay, that's the first question. And go ahead and answer that. And then I'll leave you with the last question. Um, no, while we were shooting, no, I did not camp. Uh, um, basically, for the reason that, I mean, if you're, I'm on camera the entire time and then I've got, uh, you know, to go through hair and makeup and all that kind of stuff. And you have to get some sleep. You, there's no, I wouldn't have been able to risk, uh, you know, getting a, um, getting a tent and, you know, as, as nice as a, we could make it, uh, just hope that I got some sleep. Cause that would be, uh, I just have to be as, you know, focused and sharp as I can because they're long shoots, you know, you're shooting as much as you can with the skeleton crew too. It's not like you get a lot of, you know, we, we didn't have, we weren't in a studio. We had, uh, our crew was like a, a quarter of the, of a regular indie film size. Mm -hmm. It was very, cause you know, we were driving up, um, the, the, uh, you know, the roads that existed and then having to just, you know, where they stopped, get out, everybody carry equipment, everybody's helping out, you know, everybody, sound guy, medic, whatever, we're all taking stuff and we're walking another quarter of a mile to, you know, uh, uh, half a mile, three quarters of a mile into further into the woods with just the stuff. And there's no like internet, no cell phone service, no uh, um, electricity. So, you know, there was on this kind of shoot, there's no like, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, hopefully I'll, uh, somebody wake me up at six, you know? Um, so no, I did not camp out during the shoot. Good decision. Well, yeah. bo both of you, I'm so glad that Orion and Powell's put this conversation together because I've enjoyed it immensely. And Matthew, may I say so a quick word to Orion very quickly? Yes. And then I'll come back to David's last question. Yes. Uh, oh, well, I can wait. If you'd rather, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Say something about Orion. Well, since you mentioned Orion, I just want to say that uh, how much I appreciate Orion taking part in this. Orion has been a big part of my life for uh, 40 years. And uh, I wrote in the very first magazines and I wrote for 52 successive issues of Orion with my column, The Tangled Bank. And I, I, I found it a great home as a writer. And the Forgotten Language Tours were one of the greatest writing communities I ever had. And I love Orion too, Nick. Uh, and Orion carries on as the best environmental and beautiful and arts magazine with no advertisements. And they can use your support. So please subscribe, check it out. It's a brilliant presence on the earth. And thank you for, for uh, co-sponsoring us. And also Powell's, dear to my heart as well, bookstore of my life, really. So thank you, Powell's. Thank you, Orion. Well said, well said. Now, David, the last question from your listeners is, what kind of wine are you drinking? <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you what, I'm in Toronto and uh, it's, um, it's slim pickings out here. Uh, I went to, uh, you know, the Canadian wines. Um, I, and the short answer is, I don't know. I, <laughs> I just went to the, to the place called the Wine Rack, which is like Canadian wines. It's a little chain here and uh just grabbed a couple um there's a picture of a car on it and it's, it's a it's cab cabernet adjacent but it's a canadian wine i'm not going to say whether it's good or bad it's not very good um and <laughs> a it's okay it's it's what but we there's got some, there's some good there's some good wines made and in uh, Ontario now, aren't there, David? I mean, it's not I'm all- I'm excited to try them out. I'm, it's I'll, not all Catawba <laughs> anymore. Elimination, I'll get there at some point. Well, um, cheers, everybody. <laughs> yes, and, and, and thank you, Bob, and thank you, Powell's, and thank you, Kathleen. A pleasure. 
Tom, and thank you to all all y'all who uh, checked in and are listening. And if somebody tell, I think it's available on most of the streaming services. Uh, I think like I don't know where uh, Apple. Everything, almost everything except Netflix. Yeah, it's like a stream. I know that's been a question some people have had of uh, how do they find it, but I believe it's like the most you know streaming stuff. Yeah, everybody check the website. Uh, it tells you everything about how to buy it, how to buy the T-shirt, how to check it all out. And the website is darkdividefilm.com. Darkdividefilm.com. Yes. Very good. All right. All Thank right. you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Back David. to you, Kim. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's event. Please consider going to PALS and purchasing copies of these authors' books. And be sure to check out the film, The Dark Divide. Um, the link was just provided in the chat. We look forward to seeing you all again at one of our events very soon. Robert, David, Kathleen, thank you so much. We're very grateful to have you here and thank have a wonderful night. And you. Right. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.